Good day everyone, I'm Momshi Roxanne and welcome to my channel. We are done discussing the origins of language, morphology, phonetics, phonology, and now we're ready for syntax. Have you ever wondered how human beings were able to put words together to form meaningful statements? Like, why should we need to put the words in a particular order to make the sentence meaningful? Today, we are going to discuss what the syntax rules do. We will try to answer the questions, what is syntax and what are the rules of syntax? The part of grammar that represents a speaker's knowledge of sentences and their structures is called syntax. The rules of syntax combine words into phrases, into sentences. Among other things, the rules specify the correct word order for a language. For example, English is a subject-verb-object or SVO language. Sentence number one, for example, is grammatical because the words occur in the right order. The president nominated a new Supreme Court justice. Sentence number two is ungrammatical because the word order is incorrect for English. President, the new Supreme Justice Court, a nominated. Remember that the asterisk or star preceding a sentence is the linguistic convention for indicating that the sentence is ungrammatical or ill-formed according to the rules of the grammar. The second important rule of the syntax is to describe the relationship between the meaning of a particular group of words and the arrangement of these words. In short, the word order of a sentence contributes crucially to its meaning. Look at sentences 3 and 4. They contain the same words, but the meanings are quite different. I mean what I say and I say what I mean. The rules of the syntax also specify the grammatical relations of a sentence, such as subject and direct object. In other words, they provide the information about who is doing what to whom. This information is crucial to understanding the meaning of a sentence. For example, the grammatical relations in sentences 5 and 6 are reversed, so the otherwise identical sentences have very different meanings. Your dog chased my cat. My cat chased your dog. Syntactic rules also specify other constraints that sentences must adhere to. Now, look at the statements in item number 7. Can you identify which one of them is ungrammatical? It is more likely that you will find the sentence 7D grammatical and the ones in 7A to C are ungrammatical. Why? Because the syntax rules specify that a verb like found must be followed by something and that something cannot be an expression like quickly or in the house but must be like the ball. So, the boy found the ball. Similarly, you might find sentence 8b grammatical while sentence 8a is not. Disa slept soundly. The verb sleep patterns differently than find in that it may be followed solely by a word like soundly but not by other kinds of phrases such as the baby. How about in the following sentences? Can you identify the grammatical and ungrammatical statements? Zach believes Robert to be a gentleman. Zach believes to be a gentleman. Zach tries Robert to be a gentleman. Zach tries to be a gentleman. Zach wants to be a gentleman. Zach wants Robert to be a gentleman. Oh yes, 9A, D, E, and F are grammatical, and 9, B, and C are not. Now let's study item number 10. We see that the phrase run up the hill behaves differently from the phrase run up the bill, even though the two phrases are superficially quite similar. For the expression ran up the hill, the rules of syntax allow the word orders in 
10A, Jack and Jill ran up the hill. And 10C, up the hill ran Jack and Jill. But not 10B, Jack and Jill ran the hill up. In ran up the bill, in contrast, the rules allow the order in 10D, which is Jack and Jill ran up the bill, and 10E, which is Jack and Jill ran the bill up, but not 10F, up the bill ran Jack and Jill. The pattern shown in 10 illustrates that sentences are not simply strings of words with no further organization. If they were, there would be no reason to expect ran up the hill to pattern differently from run up the bill. These phrases act differently because they have different syntactic structures associated with them. In ran up the hill, the words ran up the hill form a unit. The whole unit can be moved to the beginning of the sentence as in 10C, but we cannot rearrange its subparts as shown in 10B. On the other hand, in ran up the bill, the words up the bill do not form a natural unit so they cannot be moved and 10F is ungrammatical. Our syntactic knowledge crucially includes rules that tell us how words from groups in a sentence or how they are hierarchically arranged with respect to one another. Consider the sentence, the captain ordered old men and women off the sinking ship. The phrase old men and women is ambiguous, referring either to old men and to women of any age or to old men and old women. The ambiguity arises because the words old men and women can be grouped in two ways. If the words are grouped, they are as follows. Old modifies only men, and so the women can be of any age. When we group them this way, the adjective old modifies both men and women. The rules of syntax allow both of these groupings, which is why the expression is ambiguous. The following hierarchical diagrams illustrate the same point. There are two diagrams that are shown on your screen, so let's study the first structure. The first structure, old and men, are under the same node and hence old modifies men. In the second structure, however, Old shares a node with the entire conjunction men and women, and so modifies both. Syntactic rules reveal the grammatical relations among the words of a sentence as well as their order and hierarchical organization. They also explain how the grouping of words relates to its meaning, such as when a sentence or phrase is ambiguous. In addition, the rules of the syntax permit speakers to produce and understand a limitless number of sentences never produced or heard before. The creative aspect of linguistic knowledge. A major goal of linguistics is to show clearly and explicitly how syntactic rules account for this knowledge. A theory of grammar must provide a complete characterization of what speakers implicitly know about their language. Are you ready to study the sentence structure? Suppose we wanted to write a template that described the structure of an English sentence, and more specifically a template that gave the correct word order for English. We might come up with something like the following. Determiner, noun, verb, determiner, noun. This template says that a determiner, or an article, is followed by a noun, which is followed by a verb, and so on. It would describe English sentence such as the following. The child found a puppy. The professor wrote a book. The runner won the race. 
The implication of such a template would be that sentences are strings of words belonging to particular grammatical categories or parts of speech, with no internal organization. We know, however, that such flat structures are incorrect. As noted earlier, sentences have a hierarchical organization, that is, the words are grouped into natural units, the words in the sentence. The child found a puppy may be grouped into the child and found a puppy corresponding to the subject and predicate of the sentence. A further division gives the child and then found and then a puppy and finally the individual words the child found a puppy. Let's see the parts and subparts of the sentence in a tree diagram as shown on your screen. The tree is upside down with its root encompassing the entire sentence. The child found a puppy and its leaves being the individual words. The tree diagram shows, among other things, that the phrase found a puppy divides naturally into two branches, one of the verb found and the other for the direct object puppy. The last topic for this video is the constituent and constituency tests. The natural groupings or parts of a sentence is called constituents. Various linguistic tests reveal the constituents of a sentence. The first test is the standalone test. If a group of words can stand alone, they form a constituent. For example, the set of words that can be used to answer a question is a constituent. So, in answer to the question, what did you find? A speaker might answer, a puppy, but not found a. A puppy can stand alone, while found a cannot. The second test is replacement by a pronoun. Pronouns can substitute for natural groups in answer to the question, where did you find a puppy? A speaker can say, I found him in the park. Words such as do can also take the place of the entire predicate found a puppy, as in John found a puppy and Bill did too. If a group of words can be replaced by a pronoun or word like do, it forms a constituent. A third test of constituency is the move as a unit test. If a group of words can be moved, they form a constituent. For example, if we compare the following sentences to the sentence, the child found a puppy, we see that certain elements have moved. It was a puppy that the child found. A puppy was found by the child. In the first example, the constituents a puppy has moved from its position following found. In the second example, the position of the puppy and the child have been changed. In all such rearrangements, the constituents a puppy and the child remain intact. Found a does not remain intact because it is not a constituent. In the sentence, the child found a puppy, the natural groupings or constituents are the subject, the child, and the predicate found a puppy, and the direct object, a puppy. Some sentences have a prepositional phrase in the predicate, like for example, the puppy played in the garden. We can use our tests to show that in the garden is also a constituent, like, where did the puppy play? In the garden, that's stand alone. The puppy played there, that's replacement by a pronoun like word. In the garden is where the puppy played, move as a unit. It was in the garden that the puppy played. Our knowledge of the constituent structure of a sentence may be graphically represented by a tree diagram. As you can see on your screen, there's a tree diagram for the sentence, the puppy played in the garden. Every sentence in a language is associated with one or more constituent structures. If a sentence has more than one constituent structure, it is ambiguous and each tree will correspond to one of the possible meanings. For example, the sentence, I brought an antique desk suitable for a 
lady with thick legs and large drawers has two phrase structures, trees associated with it. The two phrase structures for this presented in a tree diagram will be shown in the next video.